about three weeks ago. I'm uh, doing it again here. So, off the Okay. So, man versus machine. If you look at robot, robots today, something's missing. Go ahead. Okay. So, there's a need for robotic fingers and hands that can do the same work as humans. Because most of the work in automation, at least in assembly, is done by humans using their hands. Okay? Go ahead. Uh, there's been some, a real need for, for this kind of capability. This is uh, Foxconn, which is a good customer of my company. They spent uh, $20 million on robots, uh, Japanese robots, ones that they weren't being, they, then they couldn't use them. Because the robots only had grippers, they couldn't pick up small parts, couldn't maneuver them, they needed robotic hands. Go ahead. Okay, here's some other places that, that do it. Um, we do a lot of work with Apple, we do a lot of work with Samsung. With our devices, we can bump into servers, push and pull, feedback information, they're mechatronic. But UL and Apple want devices that can do more. They want devices that can sweep, for example. There's a big push for that. Go ahead. Okay. So we haven't seen robotic hands and we haven't seen robotic fingers in automation, and why is that? What's the problem? Go ahead. Well, first take a look at the finger. Your finger can push with about 10 newtons. Okay. Finger has very small joints, 20 millimeter, 30 millimeter. Okay. And the fingers can also vary forces very quickly. Okay. Next. The finger is also flexible. It can push. It has compliance. So a very good solution for a robotic finger is a finger with direct drive motors. That gives you compliancy, gives you precision, the capability of doing precise forces. You can do precise forces with geared motors, but they're not compliant, which is why you don't see geared motor, or geared motor driven robotic fingers in automation, they break. Go ahead. Okay. So the problem that that's faced everyone is you have to develop a very powerful, very small motor, direct drive, that can duplicate the forces that a human has or can produce this. So this is um, uh, three generations of FUMOs, functioning models for us. We started out as a, as a baseline, that Swiss motor on the right. That one puts out, um, what is it, 16 million newtons, 48 volts, and three amps. Very large, too big for a robotic finger, although DARPA and Google use that to develop a very large finger, which is impractical. So, what you gotta be able to put out is about 200 million newton meter in the smallest motor, and that gives you 10 newtons at the tip. It's about 30 millimeters from here to the tip. Okay? So, um, go back there, Ross. Go back one. Okay. So we started out with a 35 millimeter motor, which duplicated the torque of the Swiss motor. Still too big, and the torque way too small. Okay? Go ahead. We advanced, we advanced, and the current motor, C, has a diameter of 25 millimeter, runs on 48 volts, uses 1.5 amps, which is too high, but still, 1.5 right now. Go ahead. Has a torque of 140 millinewton meter. It's about two thirds of the ideal. And so it, it puts out about seven newton per finger. And it's been integrated with some other motors to develop a robotic finger, which is about one and a half times bigger than a human finger. 
all direct drive, all relatively low current, but not low enough. Okay, go ahead. Okay, we call this a partial motor. It has a uh, rotary encoder. It's, we make our own encoders at SMAC. This is a 15,000 count motor, our, our encoder. And it has a very, very unique, a very, very unique motor design. We have another one, which is 35 millimeter. Uh, that's, that's this back joint. Both these, both these motors, by the way, are plus minus 45. Your finger moves plus minus 45, plus minus 45, plus minus 15. That pushes with 10, that pushes with 10 newtons, that pushes with three newtons. Okay, second one's about the same. We're getting the same kind of result in seven newtons at the tip. The rear, plus minus, the plus minus 15, uh, has a motor based on a variation of what we currently made which are moving oil motors, and that already meets the requirements we need to have a low current, plus minus 15 joint. Okay, so these are all been integrated into a structure, uh, weighs approximately 350 grams, and again, as I said, it's about 1.5 times the size of a human finger. Go ahead. Okay, a little bit about us. Uh, company's been around making these devices for about 20 years. Uh, it's, during that time, we've developed technology, patented technology, to bump into surfaces, to push and to pull. They're used in circuit board assembly. This is assembly on that was up there. They're used for testing all sorts of devices. Oh, where's my, where's my phone? Most of, the, uh, most of what you see in an Apple phone has been manufactured or assembled using our devices. Okay, all these, all these capabilities fit right into a direct drive robotic finger. All right, what goes on next? Well, Toyota's been in, in, in. Toyota has a special development going on for a robotic hand and wrist and arm. And they said, well, you got to get down to 20 and to 30 because Japanese fingers are 20 and 30. I lived and worked seven years in Japan, so I get that. It's a challenge. We're now in the midst of making two more iterations. We just finished one, increased our torque again by 35%, which allows us get, get to get to the 20 and the 30, but with high current. All right. Eventually, the target is to get something that, that exactly duplicates what a finger can do. We should have that uh, by the tail end of this year. Go ahead. Uh, we're starting to lay out the thumb, and we're working on controls. That is our current controller amplifier, 2448 volt. Uh, that runs our actuators. It's about the size of your finger. It's the smallest commercial amplifier controller in the world, I believe. That, in, con in conjunction with a master controller, will give us the capability of running all the different axes in two hands, at a very, very good price. Our target is to make a hand with controllers this price $5,000. I was told by SRI in Chicago two weeks ago, it's too much. So we'll have to work hard. Right. Okay, go ahead. All right, another aspect we're working on is fast programming. This, uh, the previous uh, presentation is kind of interesting to me. His is static, or if that was dynamic, you'd have a product I, I would like to use. So, we're working on other ways of tracking um, and being able to program very quickly. This is a typical example of something where someone has moved our actuators around, we've, got, we've got, copied the movements, and we duplicate exactly what the person did. That's that's a uh, pretty common technology. We believe if, if we use more advanced tracking, we can use that for quick programming of automated assembly applications. There's a, a possibility of a 
of a prosthetic, uh, prosthetic can. People ask us about that. Yes, we can make it. And we have very, very simple ways of programming that, which might make it very attractive. And the technology opens itself up to very small SCARA robots. In Chicago, I saw Fanix latest. They called it a mini robot. I would have, or a micro robot. I would have called it a mini. Uh, we'll be, at the end of the year, we'll be coming out with robots that are the size of your finger, a little bit larger. We're working with Sony and we're working with Foxconn on those developments because they're assembling parts that are very, very, very small. Okay? So, I'll sum up. A key hurdle holding back the application of robots in the factory has been the lack of fingers and hands. It's quite possible that this obstacle has or can be overcome. We have a working prototype at our booth in Hall 17, as you can see. Um, and if that happens, if this thing can uh, come out and it can do what a human hand does, then that problem has been overcome. Okay. And that's it. Any questions? No? I'm very happy a lot of people showed up. It looked like there only be three or four, five minutes or, or five minutes before I started. Okay. If no questions, then I'm done. Wow. Yeah. That was amazing, Mr. Neff. There were actually uh, three or four uh, persons in the audience first, and now, let's see, they want to see you. <laughs> so in, in Germany we say Zugabe. Uh, <laughs> so just uh, an additional information maybe. So, uh, one, one, maybe one final thing, or... <laughs> oh, for me? Yeah. So, are there any, any special informations you, you are not allowed to talk to, but... Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of technical, uh, patentable uh, information. I don't so, go in, so I don't, I don't go into how we put it. Okay. Other than... Uh, maybe a tiny... A little bit. Yeah, flux density is important. Flux density? Yeah. That's very important. Um, so if, you, if some people know about this, then they'll look at that. And then coverage, uh, area coverage is very good. And the last thing is, all motors don't rotate 360. Okay, so um, feel free to ask him uh, any question, maybe in person, uh, if you like to. Now he's here, or uh, you can visit the stand, of course. So, thank you, Mr. Neff. We have a couple of minutes left for our next presentation, which will be held in German language. Also, die nächste Präsentation.